I'd like to present you right now a scenario that I think it can be tricky and you can lose or gain points based on um, on your answer. Um, and actually there is one tricky thing that um, you can expect to get besides all the knowledge that you are required to, to know for it. So we have three virtual networks, one, two, three. Each of them has a virtual machine and uh, you, you get an information that uh, vnet1 is peered with vnet2 and actually there is a bidirectional uh, peering connection and you also know that vnet3 is peered with vnet2. What I want to mention here is that at the exam day you won't get a schema like this one. You most probably get a, uh, a use case or um, they might present things in a way more complex um, way because they want you to be able to simplify things and to go straight to the point and know what the right answer is. In this case, of course, you can get information about address ranges, for example, about location, about, uh, I don't know, subnets that um, this VNet can contain or any other information. They can ask you, I don't know, they can give you information about uh, key vaults, for example, or I don't know, other, other things like that. But when you see uh, this kind of question, so is, um, for example, is V1, V, uh, virtual machine, sorry, virtual machine one can be peer connected to virtual machine two or to virtual machine three. What you have to pay attention to is the connection between the VNet. So in this case, you see it's bidirectional. And in this case, they say that only VNet3 is connected to VNet2. So for that, uh, for example, uh, let's take uh, every virtual machine, uh, every connection that could be established here. So is uh, can be v, uh, the virtual machine 1 connected to virtual machine 2? And the answer is yes in this case, because of that uh, bidirectional um, relation. Then can VNet3, uh, VM3, sorry, be connected to VM2? The answer is no. And even if they mention, okay, there is a peering connection between VNet3 and VNet2, it has to be bidirectional. And actually, this is the tricky part that you have to remember and keep in mind. If it's not bidirectional, you cannot connect VMs between them. So um, try to try to remember and try to understand actually it makes sense uh, and try to remember that uh, for the exam day. Also, if they ask you what about the connection between VM1 and VM3, as there is no peering uh, connection between VNet1 and VNet3, then you also cannot connect these two uh, virtual machines. Another scenario also related to virtual network peerings, uh, peering connection, is uh, could be this one that I represented here, uh, right now on the screen, uh, where you have four virtual networks. Each of them has these um, address ranges that I um, that I mentioned here, and I also have a subnet. Actually, they, um, each of them has a subnet and you can uh, expect to be asked what are the possible connections between, for example, VNet1 and the other VNets. For that, what you have to remember, and I'd say is the only thing that you have to remember here, is that you don't really care about uh, the subnets and their address ranges, but what you should care about is the address range for each virtual network. So in this case, what you can see if we take, uh, for example, the case, um, the connection between virtual network one and virtual network two, you can see that their address ranges overlap. So a connection between them is not possible, but you can see that uh, the address ranges for VNet3 and VNet4 don't overlap with the one for VNet1. So a connection between them, between 1 and 3 and 1 and 4 is possible. 
uh, the subnet doesn't really matter here. So you can uh, actually the exam day, day, you can even skip this part just to simplify the things and to focus only on what you really need to know because um, you, you'll you have lots of questions and you, actually that was my uh, strategy and I think um, it's quite useful. You want to make sure that you simplify things as much as possible and you go straight straight to the point without without losing in um, in details. We already discussed about SLA and what you need to do in order to guarantee a certain uh, value for uh, for it. But you can uh, also get a question like uh, this one. For example, you have a virtual machine or virtual machines and uh, they can give you different um, options and you have to know which one of them is the correct one that, that will help you in order to keep this um, SLA. At, uh, at this level. So they can say, okay, what about managed disks, network interfaces, availability sets, and scale sets. Uh, for this, uh, actually what you have to remember, and I'll go to the documentation because this is the key here, is that, uh, so for SLA for virtual machines, they say, uh, of course you can read everything, but they uh, talk about availability zones. For this one, the SLA uh, guaranteed is 99.99%. Uh, and they also talk about um, managed disks, which is 99.5, which is our uh, our case. Um, of course, you can you have premium SSDs and uh, all the other options, but in our case what we need is to know um, so we have these options and we need to know so if we um, take into consideration the documentation we need to know that managed disks and availability sets will help you to keep this level they also mention network interfaces and scale sets network interfaces it cannot be uh, yeah if you have multiple network interfaces they can be used in order to recover applications on virtual machines because you can move network interfaces across virtual machines. But here you are asked about the SLA and uh, for that you need to manage disks or, uh, and or actually Azure Variability Sets. Um, regarding the scale sets, this is uh, incorrect because uh, this can be used to scale your application and uh, maybe this, uh, actually this information can be uh, useful for another question. It can be used for high availability, but not for SLA.